In a koto kato no mai hari mai ko Laura Duni toku ingoa ke ko ngā moana fa koka aho e mahi ana he kai tohu tohu aho. Hello everyone, thank you all for being here today. My name is Laura Duni. I am a communications advisor at Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge. I'll be your facilitator today. Uh, just. While we're waiting to make sure everyone is here, I welcome you all to jump into the chat function and introduce yourself, where you are and what you do, just so we can all get an idea of who's here. Uh, I'll just leave that for a minute or two just for you to introduce yourselves and then I will uh, crack on with the webinar. Ooh. Yes, I think there may have been an issue with the chat. Apologies, it should be available to everyone now. Let me know if the chat's still disabled. Apologies for that. Kia ora, David. Okay. Oh, kia ora, Chantal, kia ora, Terry, Danielle. Nice to see you here. Um, uh, I'll introduce the webinar and the speakers and then they will take it away. So in June, thousands of scientists, business leaders, and civil scientist representatives came together at the, with uh, more than 20 heads of state and government at the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon in Portugal. They were all there to discuss myriad issues facing the ocean and to come up with innovative science-based ways to address them. Uh, our speakers today, Sally Patterson and Nigel Bradley, were both at the conference in Lisbon and have generously come along today to share what they saw and heard and, and learnt. Um, Sally is the inaugural chief executive of Live Ocean Foundation. It was established by sailors Peter Berlin and Blair Chuk. Uh, the organisation scales up marine science, innovation and outreach for a healthy ocean. And Nigel is the owner and managing director of EnviroStrat Limited. It's a specialist marine and freshwater impact investment project developer. He's also involved with three Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge projects. Now, before I hand over to Sally, <clears throat> who's speaking first, just some housekeeping about the session in Zoom. So Sally and Nigel will take turns discussing their experiences at the conference for about 10 minutes each. Then we will have about 20 minutes for Q&A. If you submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, I'll read out the questions to our presenters so everyone can hear them. Uh, feel free to send your questions through via that panel at any time during the presentation and I'll ask it for you at that Q&A question time at the end. Okay, over to you, Sally. Kia ora tato. my name is Sally Patterson and I'm the Chief Executive of Live Ocean. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you all for coming here uh, today and spending your time and listening to these reflections from myself and from Nigel about the conference that was really both inspiring and invigorating to be there, but I left with this immense sense of urgency. And that's one of the things I really want to convey to you today because we are all in this together. Uh, I was lucky enough to attend the Ocean uh, Summit with our founders, Peter Burling and Blair Chuk, and we gained accreditation as an NGO. Uh, there was a small group of Kiwis there. Uh, Ngāti Kuri Trust Board was also there. And then as New Zealanders do, we, uh, there, were, uh, there were many within other organisations. 
So the, the lens I bring to this um, or to these reflections are that of an NGO, uh, a nonprofit and one with a conservation focus. And these are very broad brush strokes. As you can imagine, it's impossible to do justice uh, to five days and 10 minutes or so. So please excuse me. Uh, next slide, please, Laura. And flip to the next one. Uh, and here we took with us the voices of 120 uh, ocean and sporting uh, legends and heroes who had committed or made a declaration to a healthy ocean. These names included former Prime Minister Helen Clark, Lady Pippa Black, Hauturua Barclay Kerr, sailors, surfers and rowers. Many of them are very well known names and they committed to using their personal platforms. When we added up the audience, it was around 30 million people that they could reach between them. Uh, we wrote these names on the life boy, and I'm sure you'll all understand the symbolism for that, because of course it's a symbol um, of distress, but also a symbol of hope and rescue. And Peter Thompson is standing there. He's also holding nature's baton, which have been traveling around the world with the ocean race. Uh, Ambassador Thompson, if we get the next slide, Laura, uh, wrote on the ring his daily mantra. And each day at the conference, when he spoke, he would stand up and repeat this again. No healthy planet without a healthy ocean and the ocean's health is measurably in decline. And he was grateful to us. And we had about 15 minutes with him the day before the conference started and felt uh, very privileged for that. But he was very clear that nothing is possible without the driving force of public opinion and that we need to move much faster. And we had a very sobering moment talking to him when he said, sure, we can keep doing what we're doing, but we will be leaving our children and grandchildren with a world full of fire, famine and war. And these are the words that come back to you at 2 a.m. over and over again. And I know everyone on this call knows this, they are inhabiting this world, they know the statistics, but the question that we need to ask ourselves as a group is how can we move much faster? Another key theme of the conference was absolutely breaking down silos um, and working across sectors. So again, I'd encourage us all to do that. Uh, next slide, please, Laura. So I, I've really got three reflections that I'll make in these 10 minutes. And despite the great urgency of the ocean crisis, the biodiversity climate crisis uh, and the climate crisis. There was, a, there was a strong message that we know what to do, we just need to do it. The conference focus was obviously on SDG 14, life below water and SDG six, clean water and sanitation. These global goals are well accepted. Uh, and the topic for the session that Sustainable Seas is hosting today is what are we doing well and where do we need to be better? Well, we must align with these global goals. We have one ocean and we need to do it in a way that's true to our country, true to Aotearoa, uh, but we can't ignore them. And if you look at our track record on some of these issues like marine protection, where we only protect 0.4% uh, of our ocean, despite having one of the biggest in the world, we're not meeting them. We need to invest in science. That message was clear, but we know enough to act understand the power of indigenous knowledge, nature-based solutions, and work out a way to measure the right things, not just what we can extract. And critically, we must keep 1.5 degrees alive, and we have a very short window to do that. The time between now and 2030 is totally defining for us. Again, there was this great sense of breaking down silos and working across countries and sectors uh, to share knowledge and solutions. Uh, many panels featured a range of representatives from island nations to world leading economies who are working together. Pacific nations had a very strong voice there. Uh, and in my experience through Live Ocean in New Zealand, we haven't reached this broad consensus about what we need to do. We must have a national conversation about our ocean. Uh, New Zealand's lack of visibility as a state actor was hugely evident here and noted by many, especially as the guardians to one of the largest and most significant ocean spaces on the planet. Uh, a few examples, over 50 countries are now including blue carbon in their NDCs, 99 countries support 30 by 30. And when we saw the Pacific voices um, and how strong they were, we, we, we need to step up to that. Uh, next slide, please, Laura. 
ocean risk is climate risk. And conversely, ocean action is climate action. So 2022 has turned into the super year for the ocean, with multiple stakeholders working to cement commitments to protect the ocean. Working towards the UN Climate Change Conference in Egypt in November and the UN Biodiversity Conference in Montreal in December. Biodiversity, of course, was another key theme intertwined with this ocean and climate, this three-headed monster. And I woke up to the news today that we've lost over 100 albatrosses alone in the past six months from fishing. And this is an area where we need to show leadership as the albatross and seabird capital of the world. Felt very lucky to hear uh, Secretary Kerry, John Kerry speak. He is a well-known ocean champion for many, many years, but now also inhabits the role as the US Presidential Special Envoy for Climate. He was clear we're not moving fast enough we must shed the pervasive business as usual, because what is being accrued today will cause damage tomorrow, and we must have a groundswell. But despite this, and despite everything we've done, 1.5 degrees is still in reach if we take tangible action, and we can have a remarkable future. So there were always these messages of hope intertwined, um, and we need to deliver on it because it most, makes both economic and moral sense. A key discussion uh, of the UNOC was blowing the Paris Agreement, discussing how countries uh, deal with the ocean and their NDCs, from green shipping to marine protection to keeping warming well below two degrees and meeting the terms of the Paris Accord. Um, next slide, please, Laura. I took this photo on my phone. It's a UNFCCC slide and really acts as a theory of change. And you'll see the ingredients that they see as being integral to blowing the um, Paris Agreement from protection and restoration, ocean at the heart of national policies, ocean-based climate solutions, decarbonizing shipping, um, COP27, and you'll see 2030 in the distance. And then I think that must represent our fiery future into 2050. So the key message, we cannot consider climate action without the ocean, which is particularly relevant for our country. 94% of which is below the waves. Uh, next slide, please, Laura. Deep sea mining is the headline issue of our time. These words were from Sylvia Earle, one of the most respected and accomplished deep sea scientists alive. And she has been very outspoken about the level of inappropriateness of deep sea mining. And given the turnout for the session, it was a defining conversation and topic for the conference. Uh, the over 100 people were standing outside the room. It was absolutely packed, the most packed of, of any session. And the room was full of people from around the world. As background to everyone on the call, the International Seabed Authority is currently working to finalize regulations and once done, will start issuing mining license, which could start as early as next year, causing unprecedented destruction of ecosystems. The good news is this can be stopped before it starts, and it just takes concerned governments to stand up. Uh, Maori Party co-leader Debbie Narewa Packer was part of the panel, and she spoke very powerful, powerfully about the experience of her iwi with seabed mining. And she has led her iwi in exercising their obligations over seabed mining um, over the last decade as guardians. So at the session, an alliance of Palau, Fiji, and Samoa announced a moratorium and called for other countries to join. There was a standing ovation, which again was the only one that I saw in the conference. And since the conference, the Federated States of Micronesia also joined the Alliance in recent weeks and Chile and Costa Rica have, caused, uh, have called for a precautionary pause. Uh, calling for the moratorium, uh, Palau president said, how can we in our right mind say, let's go mining without knowing what the risks are? We believe it is not worth the risk. We ask all of you to support that deep sea mining increases the vulnerability of seabed floor and marine life. President Macron also spoke out against the harmful effects of deep sea mining in the high seas during the conference. And it really was a defining issue for the global ocean community. So look, that was um, uh, five days packed into 10 minutes. So thank you for your time and open to any questions at the end, but I will pass over to Nigel now. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. That was awesome. So 
Uh, kia ora tato. My name's Nigel Bradley. I'll, uh, I'll talk quite a, with quite a different perspective from Sally. Um, hopefully they, they align uh, quite well. We're, we're coming at some similar challenges from, from um, I guess, from different angles. Um, do you want to just jump onto the next slide, Laura? So just a very bit of, small bit of background. I, I attended the, a similar conference in late 2018 in, in Kenya. Uh, UN Blue Economy Conference that was, and the big difference between 20, end of 2018 and now is the presence of what I'll loosely talk about, investors or investment. And uh, what, what I mean by that is when, when we were in Kenya, it was what I expected. So it was government delegations, uh, a lot of the big global NGOs, and then some of the large um, uh, multilateral banks, the World Bank, Asia Development Bank, etc. This time around, the big, big change is the presence of um, investors across the spectrum. And so when we talk about investors, that includes a lot of really large scale grant funding. It includes um, organizations that are supporting uh, startups and sort of the catalytic role that that uh, very early stage investment has right right the way through to um, private investors that have literally got billions of dollars to invest into restoring and improving um, marine environments and and developing sustainable blue economy so that that for me is uh, the theme that I'll, I'll talk about so the the picture on the left here was taken at an event for um, for investors and startups. So there was probably 250 people in the room and we all had to vote online about what is the single biggest uh, investment opportunity in the blue economy over the next decade. And so the larger the writing, the more effectively, the more votes. We all, we all got one, one thing. They didn't tell us to choose from anything in particular. So what, what you're seeing here, and I'll, I'll talk in a bit more detail about seaweed nature-based solutions and, and blue carbon over the next um, few minutes. But th that represents a, um, I guess, a snapshot and apologies for the chairs, but there was literally, there was a panel that was sitting in front of that screen um, and really shows the, uh, the rapid development of investor interest across the spectrum that I think is, is both showcases how we in, in New Zealand are really, really behind uh, a lot of other countries. Uh, but but also shows this this big opportunity here as um, as we do catch up. The other thing, and, and uh, Sally touched on this as well, is the drivers for uh, for the um, the investment into oceans are a mix of climate and biodiversity. Those two not not being treated by by people um, in Lisbon as as able to be separated, which I, I think is the right way. Way to do it, and and also there's recognition that the um, the need is is greatest in developing countries, what what they were terming the global south, but actually everyone's obviously got to play their part. Can we jump to the next slide? So very very quickly, na nature based solutions. So um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the term. It, it was something that I think. Um, both in New Zealand and globally, it's it's sort of a, a very very trendy term at the moment. A lot of people are talking about nature-based solutions, not necessarily seeing the rhetoric match the um, the reality. But in, in a nutshell, it's using nature to improve environment, also climate, biodiversity, water quality, etc., um, and social outcomes. So both seaweed and blue carbon, I'll talk about in a in a moment, are examples of that. Uh, so what what you see in in Lisbon with regard to this is it was probably the single most popular term that you would have heard from the thousands of people who were there. So really, really strong growth and in interest compared to to going back to say 2018. Um, but there's still limited investment. And when I say investment, I am including grant funding. I'm including sort of government and and NGO investment that is not seeking a return. One of the areas, though, that is interesting, I think, and, and a pointer for, for us in New Zealand is the development of sustainable business models that enable the generation of revenue from nature-based solutions that provide opportunity to then reinvest more uh, from, from the revenue you can earn from nature-based solutions uh, into 
restoration. And so this this diagram here is from a, a company called Urchinomics that we are in the process of, of setting up a pilot uh, here in New Zealand. And, and the, the diver on top is, is taking urchins or kinna out of barrens, which are causing massive uh, problems un, under the ocean, growing them on land in a, in a controlled system, and then taking the row from the urchins and selling them into high value uh, Asian markets, and then reinvesting the profits from the urchin row into kelp forest restoration. So it's a really neat example of something that's just evolving here um, and is, uh, I, I think, it, from a global point of view, is a, is a really good example of finding a way of being able to cut the reliance on grant funding for uh, for restorative nature-based solutions. Recognise that there are, um, you know, there are multiple benefits here from, um, with kelp forest, kelp forest coming back you've got climate resilience and adaptation you've got biodiversity and water quality benefits and then there are the um, the broader economic and social impacts that come with that and from a New Zealand point of view there's also work that we're involved with that Sustainable Seas um, has been funding we're co-leading that with with NIWA looking at restorative marine economies and how we can generate restorative opportunities that are also going to be attractive to investors. So there's certainly a lot of interest in New Zealand and it's it's an area where I think we can reasonably quickly catch up with some of the evolving uh, global opportunities. Um, also, I think, and, and again, picking up on what you said, Sally, the um, Pacific Islands were incredibly vocal in, in Lisbon and there's, there's really strong opportunity for New Zealand through the um, the aid, aid funding that's going into uh, climate resilience and across the Pacific to actually pick up some of the opportunities with things like this, um, because a lot of the things that would be being funded anyway are effectively nature-based solutions, but really putting some structure around how and where and when you deploy these sorts of things. On the public sector side here, I think there's still pretty low awareness from government, certainly at a regional uh, and local level, but but also at a national level about what 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 is even meant by these and, and what the opportunities are. But our national emissions reduction plan mentions them, which is a good start. There's there's not much detail to um, to follow that, but I think it's it's at least recognising that this, these things are on the radar here. Can we jump to next slide, please, Laura. So seaweed is um, my favourite topic. So this was again a very very um, popular uh, theme, I guess, of, of the conference. Uh, yes, it is also, um, at least in part, a nature-based solution. But what, what I think was really instructive there is in, in Lisbon is that the sector now has got increasingly um, structured and uh, is really growing in a way that a couple of years ago you wouldn't have, have seen. And so much like with nature-based solutions, you've got a lot of rhetoric around seaweed. You've got a lot of rhetoric around blue carbon. You've got a lot of rhetoric around nature-based solutions, but not always. You, you don't always see the um, the reality matching matching the rhetoric, and that that I think is a challenge both both for us here, but but also globally. What what we also saw, and and reflecting the fact that it was one of the top um, opportunities identified by investors, is that there was huge interest globally in investing in seaweed for a whole number of um, of uses Part, partly it's, it's sort of increasing aquaculture farming farming of seaweed but also looking downstream post-harvest at lots of the innovative opportunities that come from having seaweed the ability also for seaweed in a, um, a non-farmed situation to provide massive climate and biodiversity benefits is is really well recognized what we're also seeing is some of the really interesting business models around seaweed organizations and, and greenwave in the states is a is a good example there we've got the the um, founder of greenwave actually going to be in new zealand in early october to talk a little bit about their experience but seeing non traditional business models evolving in the sector is i, I think a really good pointer for us here I reckon we're probably about 10 years behind much of the, certainly the developed world with regard to seaweed. Um, 
the uh, the lack of a supply chain in New Zealand is, has been a big constraint. We see it similarly in Australia as well. Uh, but countries that are really pushing ahead quickly have got an established supply chain. The other big weakness we have here is our regulatory environment is a big barrier to investment. And we've seen recently um, one particularly large uh, offshore organisation that was planning to come into New Zealand has said it's it's too risky in terms of getting uh, getting consent and that they have instead decided to take their investment opportunity to Alaska where they see it as having a smaller risk. On the positive side with New Zealand we've got um, work that we've been involved with with Sustainable Seas developing a national framework to guide the, um, the growth or evolution of the sector that's been led by Cawthron with uh, uh, ourselves working on that and that will provide some structure for the sector, but then we've also got uh, recently the uh, Aotearoa New Zealand Seaweed Association has been formed, so you're seeing now the emergence of, of uh, leadership um, and also the, um, the framework that hopefully will dovetail with that leadership, and then these are the sorts of things that help inform regulatory change, help inform our future investment opportunities as well. Can we jump onto that next slide, please, Laura. Thank you. So last slide for me is uh, blue carbon. Um, as I've said a couple of times, a lot of people talking about it, um, not always the, the talk matching what the reality is. But the for me, what was really interesting with this is the corporate investment interest. And so you've got global organizations like Microsoft, like Salesforce, that are investing hundreds of millions and, and billions of dollars into blue carbon projects recognizing that uh, it's not just about carbon, it's actually about biodiversity and a whole lot of other benefits that are associated with these sorts of projects. Um, almost uh, uh, entirely, we are looking at the non-regulated or, or voluntary markets. So you're seeing really, really big increase in focus on uh, verified methodologies. And in particular, mangroves and salt marshes seem to be the and seagrass to a slightly lesser extent are probably the three areas where you're seeing really really strong interest from uh, both project developers and investors i found it really interesting having been involved at this end in, in some seaweed related blue carbon work is that a lot of the investors are quite skeptical about seaweeds and the the feeling is that the methodologies that have been proposed for blue carbon related projects from seaweed are still a number of years or, or even decades in some cases away from being a reality. So there is, um, I think, more interest in, in mangrove, salt marshes, seagrass, but also recognize that, in fact, you could almost frame some of these as climate resilience credits rather than just calling them carbon, uh, blue carbon credits. And, and the way in which these are framed um, will, I think, have a strong impact on how uh, how attractive they are to investors. So, uh, with you know, blue blue carbon in New Zealand, as um, this folk on the call will know far more about it than, than I do, but it's we're pretty early in New Zealand. Uh, we are, as with the other topics I've mentioned, behind the rest of the world. From my point of view, though, I think this is an example where it's probably a good thing to be a fast follower rather than a first mover in these types of things because there is so much interest and uh, investment going into developing methodologies that will enable um, consistent approaches to these things and really in ensure that um, that blue carbon and related projects are following um, and adapting obviously to our to our context but following established methodologies rather than us having to create them from scratch that will save a lot of time and uh, and money and, and pain, and um, there's, I think, rather rather than people here creating projects for which they hope there will be credits in the future, but then finding out, in fact, that they are not aligned with where investors expect or or misaligned with with particular methodologies that are starting to emerge. Again, um, from from my point of view, um, with regard to the Pacific, I think there's a really strong opportunity here for Ministry of Foreign Affairs with uh, the huge amount of investment it's going to put into climate resilience funding in the Pacific to actually look to um, to stimulate the development of blue carbon projects as a way of generating multiple benefits, um, including the, the social and, and the economic benefits, but, but also um, the climate resilience and adaptation. The 
Um, blue carbon is, from the government point of view, I guess it's listed. It's certainly there'll be nothing anytime soon in, in the emissions trading scheme, but uh, it is explicitly listed in, in the emissions reduction plan alongside nature-based solutions. Not much detail, unfortunately, but um, I guess it, at the very least it signals that there is interest uh, and recognition at, at a government level that these sorts of things are important and the next um, couple of years is probably going to be pretty informative I think in how projects start developing here, how some of these global methodologies can be adapted and applied to New Zealand. So that I think is all I had to say. Laura. Lovely, thank you so much Nigel and Sally, much appreciated. Now uh, don't be shy, we do have the question and answer available for anyone who has questions. Uh, we have about 20 minutes um, to have a bit of a discussion here with Nigel and Sally. Um, so I've got a question for you, Nigel. Um, what do you see as the role of New Zealand's government in enabling the kind of investments that you've discussed? I, I, I mentioned a couple of times the, the term catalytic investment and what I mean by that is the and, and we saw we see this and saw this in Lisbon a lot is that a lot of there is a huge amount of interest globally in, in these sorts of um, of initiatives but who's going to take that first step and effectively the you know the, the first the first investor in these sorts of things which are new a little bit uncertain is taking the greatest risk with some of these things will fail and, and that for me is a, a really um, important role for government is in recognizing the, uh, the role of de-risking something so that in the future, others who may not have as strong a risk tolerance are able to follow. I don't think it's a government only thing either. I think it's, it's really, again, an important role for government in addition to providing some of that risk uh, capital, but, but also to uh, gather others the le the legitimacy that government uh, agencies can provide is is really important when uh, especially for where you've got international organisations that are thinking about putting say grant funding or um, or even investment into projects they they look at um, a project where you have a government effectively they see it as endorsement uh, and so it's both providing some of that catalytic capital but it's also enabling others to come in around them in a way that de-risks or legitimizes a project for uh, for others. And what kind of, we've got a question here from Angus, thank you. What kind of regulatory changes would you like to see at a local government level to facilitate some of the things that you've talked about? Uh, that's for me, I guess, is it? Yeah. Yes, sorry, that was actually from Hannah Palmer. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Hannah. <laughs> uh, the... The, one of the we've got some huge challenges here. So some work we're doing in the Hauraki Gulf, for example, um, with seaweed farming is is you've got this an invisible line down the middle of the Gulf that separates Auckland from Waikato regions, and at a at a regional council level, you have got con completely inconsistent approaches to what is a line that has been drawn on a map, and um, what what that what that leads to is uncertainty where one region will treat, uh, say, seaweed, as an example, in a completely different way to the, to the next region. And so I think there's, there's a massive need for coordination there across boundaries. There's also um, the, and, and I guess some of these opportunities will come through RMA reforms and the like, but we, um, we've dabbled once with marine spatial planning in New Zealand with the um, sea change the Hauraki Gulf Marine Spatial Plan, but we haven't gone anywhere further with it. And investors um, of all shapes and sizes would, they get a lot of value out of consistency and certainty and things like marine spatial planning as a tool to provide, uh, not, it's not just identifying where you as a, as a council or government want to see things going, it's also where you don't think things are appropriate, but having a spatial delineation uh, right around the country is, is I think, super important, and it's something where we've we've tried it, we've done it once, um, but we haven't yet 
managed to get proper momentum behind marine spatial planning. So that's another thing I think we should be doing here. I've got a question for Sally. Um, Sally, hi, how do you define 0.4% of New Zealand ocean space being protected? Oh, you're Sorry, mute. that is pretty well accepted and that's using IUN, IUCN guidelines. Uh, if you email me, I'm happy to provide the information on that. Um, yeah, 0 0.4, I think we're equivalent to China and Russia. Okay, I've got another question for you, Sally. Uh, in your role uh, as an NGO, is there broad support for a national conversation about health for the ocean? Yeah, look, we hear it every day. New Zealand is an ocean people. We have this immense connection to the ocean, but I think there's a distance between how we feel about it and how we plan for it. Uh, and we get emails every day. I'm, I'm constantly blown away by them and from around the country. But I think we've got into this narrative where it's too hard or we're too small to make a difference. But what we see is this incredible opportunity for our country. We have got the fourth largest ocean in the world. What we do in our ocean space matters on a global scale, both in terms of climate and biodiversity um, and the health of the moana. And um, do you think, and this could be uh, from for both of you, do you think there's a sense of frustration globally uh, at New Zealand's lack of voice on ocean health? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It was... I, I guess one of the more disappointing takeaways for probably both both of us as as Kiwis over there that um, we knew the country um, had so little or had nothing to say about about some of these things and had a really um, and when you compare especially when you compare it to a lot of our our neighbours in in the Pacific which are much smaller much uh, much less resources available to them but they are so far ahead of where we are with um, with the willingness to, to do things, to take risks, to, to make change happen. Do you agree with that, Sally? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, another question here. Um, should the 30 by 30 target still be supported if there are not strong quantitative measures to ensure protection of the marine environment? Is that for me or is that for Nigel? I think yeah. it's for me. can answer it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, I think we'd probably need to unpack that question a little bit more, but 30 by 30 is a broadly accepted global goal. Um, and it has been accepted by a huge amount of the world's scientists. I think we need to have a national conversation about how that looks in our country. And that's the bit that we need to get started on um, rather than rushing into the solutions, but talking about what we want for our ocean for the next generations. Mm. One, one thing just on, on that question also adding uh, to, to what Sally just said, we, Sally and I were both at a, an event uh, called the Blue Nature Alliance, which exists to fund implementation of large marine protected areas around the world. And that includes New Zealand. And so it's, it's, a, it's a really significant sum of money that exists to help with things like what we're talking about here. Uh, obviously, if, if you don't have marine protected areas you're not going to be sort of eligible for that but I think the, the the 30 by 30 target one one of the things that is a risk is so I think what the the, um, the question is driving at is how, how do you implement it if you if you don't have the resources you don't know exactly what you want to be doing with them and and that's actually where some of these other um organizations and alliances are wanting to put money into it so that they they need New Zealand to be willing to um, to move uh, first they can't they can't force us obviously to do anything so just an interesting I think sort of add on to what Sally said. Okay uh, another question here um, Sally thanks for your presentation uh, the need to halt moves from NARU and the International Seabed Authority and the metals company to mine the seabed surely must be one of the most urgent things to protect both the climate and biodiversity. New Zealand's position is somewhat ambiguous. How do you read the New Zealand government's position now? 
Look, I think it was um, the New Zealand government appears to be moving on it, um, and it was uh, satisfying to see uh, Debbie's private members bill get picked from the ballot box. Uh, so we expect a discussion. I think all the ingredients are there for New Zealand to make a move on this. Okay, um, a question here from David. We keep saying government needs to step up here. The private sector can't undertake the amount of blue economy investment needed unless it's some sort of joint model, as Nigel has said. But it seems we're struggling to bring government to the table in a systematic way. Systematic way. How do we make sure we do what we need to do before it's too late? Good question, David. Um, the, it, it's the systematic part of it is, uh, I think, the, the key word there. So we have um, different agencies are stepping up in, in different ways, but it's going across them. That, that I think is the issue. So I mentioned a couple of times the um, the emissions reduction plan, uh, national adaptation plan, you know, they are explicitly mentioning some of these sorts of things. So that's great. And, and that's driven out of MFE. Um, you've got funding mechanisms like the um, Sustainable Food and Fibre Futures Fund, which is awesome. And that's run out of MPI and that's investing in a whole lot of seaweed stuff, for example, um, and, and some blue carbon work. So it's not that they are not um, interested. I, I think genuinely, David, we have, um, and maybe it's just a case of getting some of the leaders within government at, at a pretty senior level, collectively in a, in a discussion to identify uh, what what is needed from them, because there's a mix of, part, part of it is, is on a regulatory or a policy side, part of it is on a funding side, the catalytic capital I was talking about. Um, part of it is that the government um, holds a huge amount of data and knowledge, and that knowledge is really important for the private sector blue economy investment that we're, that we're talking about. So it's, um, I, I, I think, at the very least, David, I would be getting folk from MPI, DOC, uh, MFE, at, at the very least, um, in, into a, a discussion at a very senior level to identify collectively or systematically what uh, what is needed from um, government, both politically and and from a policy point of view and funding, uh, and do do that as soon as we can. And um, I think probably I'm seeing here that David's putting his hand up saying he wants to do that. <laughs> and Nigel, look, I would just add to that: we need leadership at the highest level, but also we mustn't forget MFAT's role in this because right. they are responsible yeah. for our ocean from the 12 nautical mile to the 200 nautical mile. So. Uh, there are many agencies involved and it needs to be an interagency approach. Great. Uh, we have a seabed mining question here for Sally. How do you respond to the economic well-being arguments from the likes of the Cook Islands? Well, actually, I think Debbie spoke to that and that was her point at the conference that when it came to seabed mining, her iwi had not prospered and in fact had faced many uh, social and economic issues in the years that other organizations made money from that. So um, I would direct any questions to her. I think she can answer that much better than me. Great. Um, and one Sorry, um, Laura, can, I, can I just also just respond to, to that as well, if, if that's okay. Um, I, I was involved a number of years ago now um, working for NITA, who opposing the Chatham Rock Phosphate deep sea mining application. And I think the you've got to turn that question that was asked of, of Sally around the other way. And it's not, so you've got the economic, well, you've got economic interests from um, proponents of it, but you've also got the risk to economic, uh, legitimate economic sectors. So in, in the case of the Chatham Rocks phosphate, the, the concern there was um, mostly deep sea fisheries, but also the potential impact on whale watch, the Kaikoura whale watch. and you'll see this in a, in a country like Cook Islands, tourism is obviously such a massive part of, of their economy and, and the risk of something that is relatively poorly understood is, um, is really, really significant in, in the context of, of a sector or a, a sector that wants to be developing like that. So. Um, question here, how do you think Aotearoa and the global community is doing when it comes to working with tangata whenua, indigenous peoples, on ocean conservation, 
conservation to make sure their customary rights and interests guaranteed to guarantee guaranteed through titidity and treaty settlements are protected in the process of meeting these international targets. Certainly indigenous knowledge was a, a hot topic and I think in many ways New Zealand is doing a fantastic job in terms of integrating science and maturanga, um, but also in how we're weaving to uh, through to uh, value systems in our educational materials and that was definitely mentioned to me that New Zealand is considered a, a leader in this. Um, I do think that in terms of ocean protection, for example, customary rights, indigenous rights uh, are, are considered very carefully and customary call tools are allowed for. Um, I think the more technical analysis of this, again, I would leave to others, but I do feel that in many ways, New Zealand is uh, playing a leadership role in terms of, um, in, in terms of reflecting the two value systems. Yeah, the only other thing I'd add to that um, is the globally with marine protected areas, the evolution away from um, what we call marine reserves here to um, other other uh, types of, of marine protected area is something where I think we're still um, evolving in, in New Zealand. And that clearly is has been a big challenge with um, a number of attempts here to um, to develop marine protected areas and so making sure that we're open to the ideas that can be indigenous led absolutely but that are beyond just the marine reserve concept of, of lock it up and leave it I'm not saying that we shouldn't have marine reserves but actually there are a whole lot of other ways in which you can still have really strong marine protected areas that don't require the locking it up which has been a source of, of huge angst for uh, for Māori for a long time. Um, kia ora, Dr. Marta Rebo from AUT. We've recently published a study providing the first estimates of the footprint of anchoring to the coastal seabed in Aotearoa. Considering the increasing trends in global marine traffic predicted in the coming decades, we're interested in continuing our research on the total impact, physical, bio, geochemical, environmental, etc., of anchoring of high tonnage vessels in New Zealand and worldwide, if funded. I would like to know if the environmental footprint of anchoring is considered in complications of human impacts in marine ecosystems. I haven't seen it considered. Um, Sally, I don't know about you. No, I haven't either. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, that um, covers it off for all the questions that we have in the Q&A here. So, Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for coming along today and listening. And of course, thank you to uh, presenters Sally and Nigel. Really appreciate your time. A recording of this webinar will be emailed out to all of you within um, in the next 48 hours. Um, so thank you very much for attending and we we'll appreciate it. Thank Ka you. Thank you everyone for your time. Thanks.